Well, I, I would like to warmly thank uh, Pepe, John, Bertrand, and Todd for uh, this beautiful conference. I'm trying to buy Todd's uh, uh, gentleness by thanking him. <laughs> and uh, uh, well, I, I'm having a great time, and I'm pretty sure I'm not the only one. So, uh, okay, so I'm going to tell you about representations of the fundamental group of the whitehead link complement, so WLC was, will always stand for whitehead link complement in my talk. And uh, I would like first, as an introduction, to, to motivate what I'm going to tell you uh, after. So here is a, an example of something uh, nice. Uh, let gamma uh, be a subgroup of PU21 uh, discrete. So this is already nice in itself. And uh, well, gamma, oh, sorry, I'm breaking all the chokes. Uh, I need more of them. So gamma acts on. Uh, the complex hyperbolic two space H two C, which we can think of as the unit ball uh, in CP two, uh, equipped with the complex hyperbolic metric. Well, and actually, I want to put a closure on that, so it acts on the closure of the unit uh, ball, which is obviously the unit ball and its boundary. And its boundary is S3. And so as gamma is discrete, so we have a, uh, we have a, a, a limit set lambda gamma, which is contained in S3. And uh, I want to look at the complement of this limit set when it's not empty. So omega gamma, and I'm going to look at the complement in S3. So in S3, so uh, gamma acts, sorry, I'm, I'll try to be gentle with the chokes, discontinuously on omega gamma. So, of course, omega could be empty, uh, uh, for instance, if lambda gamma is a, is a lattice, but I'm not going to consider this case. I'm going to consider the case where omega gamma is non-empty, and when that's the case, we can look at the quotient of omega by the action of gamma, and this is, well, this can be a three-manifold, or a, maybe it can be a three-orbifold, but it's something uh, like that. Let's say a three manifold. And well, it is naturally equipped with a certain structure. Which uh, is called a spherical CR structure. So I'm not going to be very specific about, about this, but let's say it's the structure that has a manifold like that. So CR stands for Cauchy-Riemann, and it's a general uh, structure for, say, a real submanifold of, of a complex vector space, for instance. And spherical is just referring to S3. So that's a manifold that has the structure of S3 as a real submanifold of C2. And, uh, well, before going any further, uh, maybe I'd like to give you a few simple examples. And the first one is going to be when uh, gamma is a, is a finite group generated by one elliptic element where 
uh, well, I'm not just taking any elliptic element, so let me make a drawing. So this is going to be H2C. And this elliptic element preserves two orthogonal complex lines. So I'm drawing in, in four dimensions. Well, I will do my best. So these two potatoes are uh, um, actually disks seen in some sort of perspective. So contrary to the, uh, to the drawing, they intersect in only one point, which is that point. And the elliptic element acts on both these complex lines as a rotation, and I'm going to assume that it acts as a rotation through an angle 2 pi over p, and here 2 pi over q. So it has finite order. And if you look at the quotient of S3 by the action of this group, what you get is a length space. So this is an example of a manifold uh, that you obtained. Yes? Sorry, I... I think it's, uh, it may be, uh, especially in electric case, it's not a manifold. Well, here, the, the, what happens is that you have a fixed point inside the ball, but you have no fixed point on the boundary. So that's an issue. It can very well be the case that you have elliptic elements in the group that have fixed point inside the ball, but not outside. So it's not, there's no contradiction. It can be a manifold. Well, it's, it's just a, a finite group, so there's, yeah, yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, then a second example, which I'm, going to be less uh, specific about is when gamma is generated by a, a single loxodromic map. And in that case, you get S2 times S1. So you have to think a little on it, but that's not very complicated. And a third example, which is slightly more involved, is when, for instance, gamma is a surface group preserving a disk, an embedded disk. So for instance, it can preserve such a, such a complex line or a real plane or something more complicated. But in these cases, the result is, uh, well, the quotient of the ball by this is a disk bundle over the surface. And if you look at the boundary, you get a circle bundle uh, over uh, sigma, where sigma is the surface. Now, a fourth example, which is more complicated, is due to Rich Schwartz. So it's around 2000, 2002 maybe. Schwartz came up with an example where omega gamma over uh, gamma is homeomorphic to the whitehead link complement. So at some point, I'm going to draw a whitehead link complement, but uh, I need to I want to do this as late as possible because I want to have an excuse to, to, to not being able to <laughs> drawing a white link complement. Okay, so this is a very interesting object because uh, what we obtain here is a, manif a complex hyperbolic manifold, which is the quotient of the ball by the action of gamma, of which boundary is the white link complement, which is a real hyperbolic manifold. So we have an object which is real hyperbolic 
uh, on the outside and complex hyperbolic in the inside. And Schwartz gives a delicious name to these things, which is rho chi. So that's the, the acronym of his PDF file, actually, if you look at it. So that's the rho key <laughs> manifold. Uh, OK. And it seems a very natural question to wonder which uh, hyperbolic manifold can one obtain this way? So now, these spherical CR structures, well, they can be thought of in terms of uh, XG structures where X is S3 and G is PU21. Yes? Well, I'm being slightly unprecise on that because having a structure, well, the picture I described in the beginning is uh, more the one of a uniformization. And it could be that, I mean, they, they can have structures. So in this way, I was more thinking of a uniformization. But some of them can admit structures that are not uniformization. So that's, I'm, I'm You mean gamma here? Uh, uh, the yeah. Well, the quotient is a hyperbolic manifold. In the, it's topologically a hyperbolic manifold, uh, meaning that we could put on it a hyperbolic structure. Uh, but uh, this structure is, obvious, is clearly not hyperbolic. It's some, something I different. Have a, um, example in two dimensional case, in short key case, then the quotient will Yeah. It's it's not always this way. Are non hyperbolic. So that's why Schwartz's example was so exciting. And so we have XG structures where so X is X three and uh, G is P U two one and Whenever you have such an XG structure, you have a, a holonomy representation, which is a representation rho of pi 1 of the manifold you're putting the structure on to the structure group G. And so for that reason, if you're looking for structures, you can begin by looking for representations. And well, this is actually what, uh, um, so that there's a, a program initiated by, by Falbell, uh, which uh, looking, which is, well, the, the question is to try finding representations of fundamental group of three manifold into, well, Maybe the initial motivation was PU21, but then looking uh, for uh, such representation to uh, PSL3C or PG, PGL3C. And so the general idea of this, of this program is to somehow mimic Thurston's construction of gluing of tetrahedra in this frame, so you have to adapt it, of course. And uh, it's a long and difficult uh, uh, road. And uh, uh, so there's, uh, there's a few 
people I should add. So Falbel, Guillou, uh, Kozelev, Rouillet, and Bergeron. So uh, sorry, I'm not respecting the there are multiple papers, and so I'm not respecting the alphabetical order. <laughs> and I'm probably forgetting some, a few names. And, well, from, from this program came up a certain number of representations. Yes? Uh, yes, there are. I, I was kind of slipping them under the carpet. But uh, Schwartz, after, uh, well, he came up with a closed example, but he's... Uh, I mean, I don't really understand it, I must admit. So, uh, yeah. And um, uh, so they came up with a, with a family of representations. And already finding a, a representation of the fundamental group of a, of a three-manifold, a hyperbolic three-manifold to SL3C is very difficult. And then once you have these representations, you have to study them and see what can we say about them. And for instance, are they discrete? Give, give, do they give structures? And these sort of, uh, of questions. And so uh, uh, maybe the first representations, representation that, what, that was found is a representation of the figure 8 naught complement. And a few years ago, uh, though, and Falbel uh, found a uniformization. Sorry? Well, uniformization is basically uh, basically that. So that's that's a representation which is discrete. Uh, so you have an additional condition that. The elliptic fixed point inside the space should be isolated. So this is a way to avoid certain elliptic elements uh, that have that fix globally complex lines. So we don't want them. And then, of course, you want that the, the image of the discontinuity region at infinity by the group, uh, the quotient, uh, is homeomorphic to the manifold. And so, well, that's what uh, uh, Doro and Fabel uh, did for the figure eight knot. In the, so the first example was uh, the one of the white handling complement. And for many years, it was uh, not really known if the figure eight node had a, such a uniformization. And it turns out that yes. Then Doro uh, showed that these uniformizations can be deformed. So it's a flexibility result. No, they're not. I mean, there's absolutely no hope for this representation to be faithful. Because think of it. If you're in S3, the limit set is typically a curve, uh, a circle, say. So the complement of the circle is not uh, simply connected. So if you make a, I mean, it cannot be faithful. In fact, there will be elliptic elements. So there is no chance that you will do this by, a, uh, well, no chance. Well, it's, it's a little more complicated to. Uh, Oh, sorry, I don't want to, to say that it's impossible. I just want to say this is not the case here. And all the examples we know are non-faithful. And so about the connection between these structures and representations. Uh, so this is, a, sorry, I should say uh, 2013. I think that's 2014. Correct me if I'm wrong. And uh, Dero proved, in fact, that there existed two hyperbolic three-manifolds, uh, say M and N, hyperbolic three-manifold, with the property that we have two representation, rho 1 of pi 1 of M to pu to 1, rho 2 with pi 1 of N to pu to 1, such that rho 1 and rho 2 are conjugate and both give uh, uniformization, 
this statement is, is a little weird, but okay. Uniformization of M. So it means if you start from a, a, the fundamental group of a surface, represent it, you show that it's discrete, and then you analyze the quotient, you can have surprises. It's not always the manifold you started from. And, well, these two manifolds, I don't want to be too explicit about them, but, uh, well, if these names tell you something, they don't tell me, I mean, these people are secret agents. <laughs> M05, am I right? Well, 15, yeah. So, I, I yes? Uh, they have conjugate images. No, no, no. Of course, no. But I guess uh, none of them is none of none of them is is faithful. And well, no. so what I would like to do now is to present you uh, a family of uh, representations of the uh, fundamental group of the white headling complement, uh, which is. Well, it's not simple, because when you want to analyze it, it turns out that it can be quite complicated. But it's actually simple to describe. So uh, representations of the white head link complement. So pi 1 of. So what is the white head link complement? Now I have to face my. Sorry? It's a the image of no the, I mean, both both uh, uh, yeah so the here's the white headling complement uh, well it's almost. It's almost nice. And uh, um, so what is the fundamental group of, of this thing? So pi 1 uh, is generated by two elements with one relation, R of u and v. And I'm going to write down this relation. So R of u and v is actually the product of four commutators, u, v, and then each time you change commutator, you change one power to one, one element to its inverse. So you get u, v minus one, u inverse, v minus one, and u inverse, v. Okay? And so this element is, uh, is, is, is trivial. So if you want to find a representation of the fundamental group of the white handling complement to PU21, it means you have to, well, or to SU21, which is a triple cover of PU21, so it's not a big deal. Uh, you have to find two matrices in SU21 uh, that satisfy this relation. And a priori, this is uh, uh, really complicated because uh, well, it's polynomial equations among the coefficients of, of this matrix, so it's, it's difficult. So here is a, uh, an observation. Um, well, if you look at the free product of two copies of z over three z, well, it is a quotient of uh, I'm going to denote this group pi. And well, we can quickly prove this because it's a, it's a simple exercise. Well. No, it's not, it's not exactly true, but uh, what I'm going to do is to write u equals to st. Well, s and t are the generators of this product, and v equals uh, tst. Why not? Uh, and uh, if I compute this, r of st TST is equal to the commutator of ST and S inverse T minus 3 S inverse squared. Well, that's a computation. And clearly, 
this is zero in the if s and t have both of the three. Okay, so in fact, it tells us that. Well, okay. So sorry. I, 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 okay, so clearly, uh, if I do this, I define a morphism from this group here to that group here, and if I mod out by the kernel of this morphism, I see that. Uh, this guy here is a quotient of that, that guy here. And the consequence I'm interested in is the following. Any group generated by two order three elliptic elements in PU21 is a representation of pi. So that's nice because it gives us a lot of examples. And I'm going to uh, say a little more uh, about the set of, of these groups. And maybe the first remark I, I would like to, to do is that Schwartz's group belong to that family. So it is generated by two other three elements. And of course, this representation is not faithful. Yes? Yo, it's OK. Uh, of groups generated by two elliptic elements? If, if the image group is uh, a fixed group. Uh, well, I'm going to say a little more uh, about, I mean. Uh, no, I'm, I'm trying to get at is that if you get the same group, then there's sort of finitely many topology jumps or something like that, right? Um, I'm, I'm not exactly sure of what you mean. No, I mean, if you get, say, a fixed triangle group in the image of. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay, maybe we can dis discuss it after that. Okay. So, Schwartz's group belongs to that family. Okay, so now, what is a, an order three elliptic element in SU21? So, uh, the typical example is this uh, that's a three by three matrix. And I want one omega, omega squared, where omega is a cube root of, of one. So, and well, obviously, this matrix has trace equal to zero. And in fact, the condition that the matrix in SU21 has trace zero characterizes this kind of order three elliptic elements. So now, uh, I want to compute the dimension well, make a dimension count, I should say. So I'm going to be very crude. Uh, so PU21 times, well, let's say SU21 times SU21 has dimension uh, uh, 18. And uh, so that's because SU21 has dimension, no, 16, sorry. No. <laughs> You should say something. <laughs> 16 has dimension 16, because SU21 has dimension 8. It has the same dimension as SL3R. OK? Now I'm adding the condition that the trace is 0. The trace is a complex number. So each condition uh, removes two dimensions. So I have minus 2 plus 2. So this is trace equals 0. And then I want to mod out by the diagonal action of SU21 by conjugation. So I take 8 again. And the result should be 4. 8 plus 4 is 12. OK. So we have a four-dimensional set of, of, such, uh, of such groups. So it would be possible to put coordinates, uh, slightly more precise coordinates, by geometric invariance. But I won't go into it. 
But the nice thing is that, uh, well, it's, uh, it's a big set of representations. And uh, it's a bit of a toy model representations, but still uh, not so many, I mean, not so many is known about, about these groups. And, okay, so now I would like to use traces. So trace facts uh, about SU21. So the first proposition I would like to state has probably been stated by John in his, in his course last week, the, the Goldman uh, deltoid. Oh, okay. So uh, here, is a, here is a, I'm going to consider a matrix in SU21. And then there exists a polynomial, real polynomial, such that First, well, if the trace of A is positive, then A, F of the trace of A, sorry. Trace of A is a complex number. F of the trace of A is positive, then A is loxodromic. If it is negative, then A is elliptic. And three, uh, if it is zero, then uh, it means that A has two uh, as a repeated eigenvalue, and uh, well, A is either parabolic or special elliptic. So special, special elliptic elements are those I wanted to avoid uh, in the beginning, saying that I didn't want elliptic fixed point to, to accumulate. And uh, I want A to be non-identity, so this is uh, true. Okay, so, well, this is the, F is the equivalent of x squared minus four in the realm of uh, SL2R. It is slightly more, uh, okay. Okay, before going any further, I just wanted to uh, make a remark about, about this. So this is a, uh, an algebraic observation. You can turn it into a combinatorial observation. If you know that S and T have uh, order three, then uh, I'm going to consider this octahedron. So, and when I did a P sub something, it means that P is a fixed point of the something. So here, P is a fixed point of the product ST, and here, this point is the fixed point of TS. And then, I'm going to have P S inverse T, P T S inverse, P S T S, and P uh, T S T. So there are conjugacies around these, these maps, for instance, ST and TS are conjugate by S, and these four guys here are conjugate because S has order three. So it's just a, a simple uh, computation. And now, if you assume that uh, these vertices are fixed points of, of uh, this plus the condition of order three, it tells you that this octahedron has, at least combinatorially, face identifications that match exactly with those. So this is the same octahedron, only PTS is there. PST is the point at infinity, and the four points here are the same here. So I'm, I've, it's a flattened version uh, of, of this octahedron. So it's like I'm used, doing some sort of stereographic projection. And uh, so it's exactly the same uh, pattern of identifications as here, which probably tells you nothing if you're not Thurston. But if you mod out this by, by this identification, you get the white handling complement. So that's the, the, this picture is in, in, in Thurston's note. And I mean, to me, it's uh, completely obscure. I, I, I don't see at all why the quotient should be the white handling complement. But somehow, uh, it gives a, 
Well, you can prove this theorem by doing this, actually. Uh, no, I don't think so. I, uh, well, I don't know how, I don't know. I don't think so. It, through Z3 squared, you mean? No, I don't think so. Um, I don't know. I, I, think, I think it's more likely that, that, that these representations would form a, a, a component, an algebraic component of the representation variety. But I, ha I mean, it's, it's completely experimental at this stage, so I, I don't know. Uh, OK. So here we are. And now, uh, here, we have a, a, a group generated by two uh, isometries. So here's a, a proposition. So I'm going to consider A, B in SU21. And uh, then the trace of the commutator of A and B and the trace of the commutator of, of its inverse, sorry, are the roots of a quadratic x squared minus uh, sigma x. Oh, sorry, I, I mean, I have s is there. So sigma is going to be a polynomial. And, but I have pi there, so OK. Forgive me, I'm going to have a, a slight ambiguity in my notations. So of a quadratic like this, where s and p are real polynomials in trace of a, trace of b, trace of a, b, trace of a inverse b. So actually, uh, well, this is a, a bit of a, it's not the, the most precise statement we can we can do, but it tells us that the character variety of F2 in SU21 uh, lives on this algebraic, real algebraic subvariety of uh, C5, actually. I have to, or, or 6, depending on how I. But, uh, uh, OK, so this comes from a, a similar and much more precise result. Uh, on the SL3 uh, character variety of, of F2, which is due to low town, the character variety of F2 and SL3C. And you have a similar picture. So I would like to add one more thing, which is the following. Uh, if I consider phi from SU21 times SU21, that maps AB to uh, trace of A, trace of B, trace of AB, trace of A inverse B, and the trace of one of these two commutators then each time I have a non-degenerate pair, it is determined up to conjugation by its image. So this map uh, uh, classifies pairs up to conjugation. Yeah. So phi classifies pairs up to conjugation. And of course, the image of this map is contained in the algebraic variety, which is here. But we don't know the image. And it's a complicated subset. So it's going to be a, a semi-algebraic set, but 
we don't, we don't know an explicit description. So it classifies as long as you know that the image, the image is in, in the image. Yeah, so it's not a, a very precise result. Okay, and so I would like to use this to, to say a little more about uh, groups generated by uh, pairs of elliptics. So we know uh, that here, the first two factors are going to be zero, and I'm going to call Z1 and Z2 these two. So I'm going to set a trace of ST. So uh, here, S3 equals one, T3 equals one. So I'm looking at pairs of order three elliptic elements in, uh, in SU21. And so I have trace of S equals trace of T equals zero. And trace of ST is Z1, trace of S inverse T is Z2. And now, there is one additional condition, which is here, that these two uh, traces here, so they are traces of inverse matrices in SU21, and it implies that they are complex conjugate. So, well, that's just uh, the same as in, S, as in U3, for instance. So, complex conjugate. So I have uh, one additional condition, which is that the discriminant of this equation there should be negative. If I want Z1 and Z2 to be satisfactory as, as traces of elements in SU21 that are product of two or three elliptic elements in this way. So I'm going to compute the discriminant of the equation. So I'm not going to compute it. I'm going to tell you its value. So delta is equal to f of z1 plus f of z2 plus z1 squared, z2 squared minus 27. So sorry, I'm considering a, a sorry, that's the other way around. That's a plus and that's a minus. And there is a two here. So f is the, the trace function in, in, the previous, in the previous theorem. So the obvious thing to do is to get rid of these two factors by assuming that we are in this case here. So I would, I would like uh, these two product, uh, st and s inverse t, to be parabolic. So the good thing about doing this assumption is that uh, the group of Schwartz uh, has this property. ST and S inverse T are parabolic. And actually, if you go back to here, and if you draw the same picture in, in the real hyperbolic realm, then all these should be parabolic fixed point. Because they are, I mean, uh, correspond to, to cusps of the, of, the, of the manifold. So it's somehow a reasonable thing to do. So we assume ST and S inverse T are parabolic. So what does it imply? So how does a, a parabolic map look like? So I'm going to draw a, a matrix again. So a parabolic element will be, uh, well, conjugate to an upper triangle matrix. And it has this form. So it's going to be e to the i theta, e to the i theta, e to the minus 2i theta. So it has a repeated eigenvalue, and it's not diagonalizable. So we have stuff here. And so this is it. So now, if I have two uh, uh, parabolic traces, so the trace is going to be equal to t2 e to the i theta plus e to the minus 2i theta. And I have two parabolic traces, so I'm going to have theta 1 and theta 2. And I want to plug this in a, 
in, in, the, in the equation there to see what I obtain. So let me draw the theta 1, theta 2 plane. And so, well, I am not going to tell you what, what we obtain if we plug uh, this trace into, so here we have zero, here we have zero, but we have to uh, plug this into there. But we obtain a topological disk, which is well, slightly more square than uh, a round disk. And the inside of this disk corresponds to the condition that delta is negative. And of course, the boundary is where delta is 0 and the outside where it's positive. And so we need all the representations into SU21 correspond to uh, parameters inside this disk. So reps in SU21 uh, correspond to uh, parameters with uh, delta negative. But the condition that the two commutators have uh, conjugate traces is also true for U3. So we should be careful about that. But in fact, you can check that under this assumption, you have a loxodromic trace in, in there. So all these groups correspond to representations in SU21. So in fact, uh, in fact, uh, well, the map S T goes to uh, theta one, theta two, is onto the closed disk. So all the points inside this disk correspond to a pair of elliptic of order three with the additional condition that these two guys are parabolic. So now the question is where, uh, where does Schwartz group is? Where, sorry, that's a very bad sentence. Where is Schwartz's group? So Schwartz's group has one unipotent boundary uh, element so saying that it is unipotent is just saying that uh, its theta here is zero. So I get unipotent map. And actually, it happens four times here. And in this picture, we have four copies of uh, Schwartz's group. And I'm going now to, to state a, a theorem. due to Parker and myself. Uh, if theta 1 equals theta 2 equals 0, so we, if we are in the center of this picture, uh, we have uh, S and T uniformize the whitehead link complement. So we have exactly the same behavior as for uh, Schwartz, uh, Schwartz's example. So the, the quotient of the discontinuity region in, on the boundary uh, by the action of the group is uh, homeomorphic to the whitehead link complement. And uh, OK, so uh, I would like to add just one thing. So beyond these two points, I think nothing is known in, in, in this disk. Uh, only maybe one, one more example. I think we have four copies of a group which is contained uh, in, a, in, a, in an arithmetic lattice in the eisenstein picard uh, 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 lattice. So we know that there are four points here. It's, it's four copies of the, of the same group uh, that are discrete. But 
it is not known if they correspond to uniformization or a structure or, or anything. So, well, a structure on something probably. Um, and beyond this, I think uh, not much is known about, about this slice of the, of the uh, representation variety. So how do we prove such a theorem? Well, that's about the same idea as what uh, uh, Doe and Falbell did, did for, the, the white, for the figure eight knot, and that many people did. We construct a fundamental domain, and we analyze uh, the quotient of this fundamental domain uh, by the action of the group. So we need to construct a fundamental domain inside the space, and then look at its intersection with the boundary, and then analyze the behavior on the boundary. This is uh, not simple in general, because when you want to construct a fundamental domain, well, you need to um, define faces for a polyhedron, and in complex hyperbolic space, uh, there are no uh, totally geodesic uh, faces. So you have to handle, well, there are fair substitutes for these uh, totally geodesic spaces, which are equidistant surfaces. They are not uh, totally geodesic, but still they are relatively well understood. Uh, but it means you have a, it's quite complicated to understand their intersections. It involves uh, a uh, lot of computations. And to, to finish uh, my talk, I just would like to give a, a, a geometric property of, of the boundary groups here. So uh, if delta is equal to zero, then the trace equations so which is the one which was there, sorry, I erased it, has two real uh, has a real double root. The two traces of the of the of the um, uh, commutators are real. And by uh, a result with uh, Julien Popper. This implies that uh, the group generated by S and T has index two in a anti-holomorphic uh, reflection group. So what I mean by this is that uh, just like in the, in the usual Poincaré disk, so the, the full isometric group is formed by PSL2R and uh, all the conjugates of the complex conjugation by elements of PSL2R. Here we have PU21 that acts by holomorphic isometries and we have another connected component in the isometric group which is formed by uh, uh, conjugates of the complex conjugation, like you just if you think of the unit ball in C2, you just complex conjugate the two uh, coordinates. And the complex conjugation is, a, is an isometric involution of, of the ball. And here, we can write S, this is probably too low, so I'm going to come here. S equals sigma one, sigma two, and T equals sigma two, sigma three, where these three people here are conjugate to the complex conjugation. So they are involutions. So it gives a, a nice characterization of, of, the, of the boundary in uh, geometric terms. Okay, I think I'm going to stop here. Thank you.